Mandalorian Season 3, well, that was bloody awful. And Disney allegedly spent an ungodly amount of money on this project, a reported $15 million per episode. And just a guess, the lion's share of that went on CGI monsters. Would I recommend it? That depends entirely on what you're looking for. If you want to watch some pretty but pretty stupid shallow action and a bit of a monster mash, there's barely any character development or world building and the story doesn't really go anywhere, but still, this may be for you. The Mandalorian pathologically avoids any deep ideas like they're the bubonic plague. And there are deep ideas that Star Wars desperately needs to address, and then it just doesn't. Droid intelligence is a problem in Star Wars. In The Clone Wars, R2-D2 is cleverer than most organic life forms, yet has no rights and is treated as a slave. The droids have no choice but want nothing else because that's how they're programmed. The droids in this season of The Mandalorian were clearly sentient. They had friends, they had leisure time, community, hopes for the future, and they were still kept as slaves. Clone troopers from the war are also programmed like the droids and nobody in Star Wars seems to have an ethical problem with their complete lack of rights. They're just sent to fight and die in someone else's war, a war they were bred specifically to fight. And they're not droids. They're organic life forms bred to be slave soldiers on behalf of the Republic who were supposed to be the good guys. So the Mandalorian is quite dumbed down, but that doesn't mean the Mandalorian will be impossible for you to enjoy. You just may have to put your brain in neutral in order to do it, because if you think about the story for a minute, it all falls apart. And this is exemplified by Bo-Katan and the Death Watch. What possessed Disney Lucasfilm to think that the Death Watch would make suitable heroes? Bo-Katan was a member of the Death Watch when they were a terror group when they engaged in kidnapping and assassination, when the Death Watch tried to murder the civilian leader of Mandalore, Bo-Katan's own sister, when they flamethrowered a town full of civilians for objecting to the Death Watch stealing from them and holding their family members hostage, and looking at this season of The Mandalorian in its entirety. That is who's been rewarded in the story. What moral lessons does this teach? She killed, assassinated, committed atrocities, and in the end, she got her way. The Death Watch now own Mandalore, led by Bo-Katan, after beating the bad guys, Moff Gideon and his group. And the bad guys' actions on balance are probably less egregious than those of Bo-Katan and the Death Watch. What was good about it? Well, it was visually striking. You can see the money on screen, and clearly a great many visual effects artists have put a great many hours into making The Mandalorian. It's quite pretty to look at. At its core, it has a good cast. I quite like Pedro Pascal as an actor, but he is kind of sleepwalking his way through this role. For example, this scene from the finale. The context is that Grogu, his adopted son, has just saved his life. <laughs> No, 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 no. Will you cut me loose? Yes. Thank you for your help, Grogu. Firstly, where did Grogu even come from? He was not in that corridor, only a fraction of a second earlier. He just teleported to where he needed to be, moving faster than he's been shown to be able to move in that suit. And also silently, instead of with the considerable noise that his robot body makes. And where's the emotion from Pedro Pascal? Where's the affection for his adopted son? Where's the relief that he's not going to die? Where's the gratitude for Grogu helping him? You cut me loose. Yes. Thank you for your help, Grogu. Wait, was that what that was supposed to be? Was that the gratitude? It sounds less like he just saved your life and more like he just bought you a cup of tea and a biscuit. And Pedro Pascal here is getting out acted by an animatronic puppet. 
I understand it's not even Pedro Pascal in the suit at this point. He's probably just in a sound booth somewhere. Did they even explain the scenario he was supposed to be acting out to him? Because he can do a lot better than this. I've seen him do a lot better than this in Game of Thrones. Because Pedro here is halfway towards being Hayden Christensen in the prequels after George Lucas told him not to act. What about the other Jedi spread across the galaxy? I like that the Jedi that saved Baby Yoda in Episode 4 was played by Ahmed Best, the actor who played Jar Jar Binks, because it sounds like he had a really bad time after the prequels and was subjected to such harassment and bullying that he thought about ending his own life. But sadly, the show doesn't get the best out of the acting talent it has, because the story and writing on the whole is pretty terrible. And I go into breakdowns as to why in my reviews of the episodes, and it isn't the actor's fault. They could have cast the best actors in the world, and it still wouldn't have helped. I was trying to find a way to sum up what is wrong with The Mandalorian, and the first thing that came to mind is the shallow and empty fight scenes. The stupid fight scene with the giant alligator turtle in episode 1, the dragon, the robot spider thing in the mine in episode 2, the pirates, the dark troopers, for the depth they have, the antagonists may as well be cardboard cutouts. As an example, in the first episode, the Mandalorians on a beach get attacked by a giant alligator turtle, and it's bad enough that they didn't know it was there. You would have thought they would make sure the planet their kids were on was safe. Not only did they not do that, they stayed even when they knew it wasn't safe, and their kids were getting eaten by dragons. This thing, the giant alligator turtle monster, is the size of a warehouse. Now, that wouldn't be a threat ordinarily, as the Mandalorians can fly, and the giant alligator turtle can't. But the show needs the alligator turtle to be a threat. So the Mandalorians temporarily forget they can fly in order to have the monster scene where it squashes them. Some of them engage it in melee combat. Some of them try to restrain it by firing grappling hooks into its neck. It's hundreds of times the size of them and they try to hold it down and overpower it with raw strength. And these are supposed to be legendary seasoned warriors. The sheer amount of monster fights made me think of the Lucasfilm Star Wars development whiteboard. And why was it ever a wish to have dinosaurs in Star Wars? You're Star Wars, not Jurassic Park, but look below that on the wish list. Representation slash diversity, and below that, Something that's quite difficult to read, but I think that says Arthurian legends. And oh no, that's what the Darksaber is, isn't it? Was the Darksaber supposed to be Excalibur? It's a legendary sword that grants leadership of their entire people. But unlike Excalibur, it wasn't pulled from a stone by the rightful king, or given to Arthur by a magical watery tart. It was instead something a Mandalorian pilfered from a Jedi temple they raided, according to Paz Vizsla in The Clone Wars. And Disney gave that sword to Bo-Katan, a member of the Death Watch terror group, all hail the once and future Queen. With the ending of this season, next season, Mando will supposedly be going off bounty hunting with Grogu. The bounty hunting part sounds like a good idea. The Grogu part for me, less so. Grogu in fight scenes kind of ruins the stakes. If Mando ever gets into trouble, Grogu can just use the force to levitate a giant space rhino or disarm three elite guards. But it is something. At least bounty hunting sounds better than what we got in Season 3. There are things they desperately need for Season 4 though. They need some iconic villains. Maybe Mando brings in a bounty and ends up with an Imperial Assassin after him. Maybe he meets a foe that's too much for him, that can either outthink or outfight him. Maybe a woman falls for him and he doesn't know how to react. Maybe some sort of Catwoman-like femme fatale that pushes his moral boundaries. So maybe, very tentatively maybe, next season could be better than this. It'd be hard pressed being worse. The chances are maybe not good of that happening, but you know, Hope springs eternal. Whatever it is, it can't be that bad. 
Those look good. A big salty clam would sure go great with this. 